On your chairs, you'll find a report that I'm, uh, I've been writing for the last six months. It was commissioned by the Omidyar Network, the Omidyar Network and um, it, it talks about open data's impact in the UK. I've been involved in the open data world for more than a decade. And um, when Amidia approached me to ask if anything to do with open data had had any effect in the world, I really couldn't miss the opportunity to have a good go at answering uh, that question. It was a six-month project, um, and it was interview-based. And one of the reasons that I was so inspired to answer Amidia's call was because I have never seen an idea catch fire the way that open data has. Like I say, I've been involved for more than 10 years, and when I started, um, the idea that in 10 years' time we might be discussing open data in a venue as prestigious as a BFI with 700 people um, attending a sellout conference um, was more than I could imagine. Um, but, you know, ideas catching fire is one thing, and what this report really aimed to do and what Amidia really wanted out of it was to see whether, you know, for all the excitement that we feel about open data and the projects that we um, are passionate about, how, whether, that, whether we could pin down some serious tangible impact in the real world. Often um, it's very easy to sit and, and to listen uh, to some of the amazing projects that we've heard about today in the theatre. And just from the theory of change or even from the amount of users to speculate what impact that might have in the world and to get really excited. And I certainly wouldn't want to stop that excitement in any way. But the aim of this report and this project was to see where open data was having an impact um, in, in, in the world outside. You know, to the extent that my mother-in-law, you know, when she called me up after she heard Nigel, Nigel Shadbolt, uh, on Radio 4 and said, now I finally understand what you're doing. You know, <laughs> uh, it, it's not the mother-in-law test, but it's, it's something like that. And thanks to some very um, generous thinkers that shared their time and expertise with me at the beginning of this project, um, I soon learned that studying impact is actually really, really hard. Impact can come in many forms. It can be measured in terms of economics. We can talk about it in terms of in social terms. We can talk about it in political or environmental t uh, terms. That's easy enough, but it's diffuse. You know, the open data value chain is very, very large, from the people who release the data to those who interpret it, to those who use the products that infome intermediaries create, to all the people beyond that who might, whose lives may benefit because of open data. Um, the barriers to impact can be multiple and entrenched. Um, I soon found that transport data could have a huge impact um, released in and of itself, um, and that's not a new finding. But in terms of you know our hopes to maybe solve climate change, solve air pollution, you know we may have the data. There'll be other barriers there to the kind of impact that I was looking for in this report. Um, the theory of change um, that is unique to open data is resistant to traditional impact measurement. Normally, when we are expecting to evaluate impact, uh, we want an idea of what the people who set out. Uh, what, what people who publish data set out to do, but open data by its very nature is, you know, we're publishing the data because we don't know what people could do with it. So in that, set, that way, um, it was kind of uh, resistant to, to traditional impact measurement. Also, it's, it's arguably too soon to see the complete picture for open data. So anyone looking for a systematic framework approach to evaluating open data impact, I think, based on these barriers, they're going to be sorely disappointed. Instead, what I began to see and what I'm arguing in this talk today th is that although we might be able to talk about the potential of open data in sweeping terms, um, we could talk about, you know, putative economic benefits from opening data, and Amidia and others have been very strong, producing reports that speculate on that potential. Actually, in terms of its impact, we're only, ve we're only likely to see that in fragments, in, a, in what I called a, a, a million stories. Now, I'm not going to tell a million stories today. Um, the report actually tells six, or arguably, five stories about open data impact here in the UK, and I am going to shoot through some of them. There are copies of the report there. It's also available online as of today, and um, some of the key takeaways I'm just going to flash past you now. My first, um, I'm going to do it really fast, just so, you know, as a way to kind of show you how much information <laughs> there is. 
don't, please don't try and read all the slides. My first subject of study was Transport for London. They've, they've, they're not a new subject of study in terms of open data impact, and they're understood to be a champion in this space because of the amount of data that they use, but also because of the amount of people that are reusing that data. There are over 360 apps um, in Apple, Android, and um, I think another app store uh, in total uh, that use Transport for London data at the moment. Um, there's an interesting study by Deloitte on Transport for London data that was uh, commissioned as part of the Shakespeare Review in 2013, and it uses a very interesting approach to the value of people's time. And using that approach, Deloitte found that people were saving tens of millions of pounds just by using the apps created on TfL's data. An equivalent amount, or at least a comparable amount, to the monetized time savings that were being used uh, to advocate for High Speed Rail 2, which is a major infrastructure project and requires much more investment than the more or less one, more or less one million pounds that TfL invested in order to get their data out there. Um, what I like about the TfL story is that it shows you that um, TfL, Vernon Everett at TfL said that if he had been asked to write a business case for releasing, um, he's the open data champion at TfL, and he said if he had been asked to write a business case for releasing TfL data, he'd still be writing it today. In his view, there is no business case for releasing open data. It is a leap of faith. I mean, there is a business case, but there's no like transport model, transport industry business model kind of standard business case for doing it. It's, it's essentially a leap of faith. What's great is that now that TfL have made that leap of faith, other transport authorities who are in you know various commercial strictures feel empowered to do the same. So that's why TfL is such a great story. Um, the second institution that I looked, like, looked at were, were, was Her Majesty's Land Reg Registry. And I spoke to a load of estate agents and prop tech entrepreneurs for this case study. That was a lot of fun. It became very clear that even though HM Land Registry are only releasing a subset of their land records at the moment, mainly the data that pertains to you and I, rather than you know institutions that have owned property in this country for years, corporations or um, people who inherit uh, vast swathes of property in this country, even though that small subset is you know, our data, our houses, um, there's a lot of investment that is following that data in terms of the prop tech industry. And also a state agency is changing. And here is one estate agent with a testimony as to how HMLR's data has, um, has changed his business. Um, I also s wanted to look at the way that open data was changing advocacy. And because I have a history as an advocate myself, when I was executi executive director of the Open Rights Group, which is a campaign group here in the UK, I was really keen um, to understand whether open data could succeed in and of itself in improving advocacy. And what I found was that although open data could really contribute in a significant way to advocacy campaigns, that traditional advocacy was still just as important. Realpolitik, knowing the right people, knowing the buttons to push, knowing the public messages that are going to embarrass po politicians sufficiently to uh, instigate change. And uh, that was a key message of the report. Um, another case I took on was the Open Public Services Network. They're a fantastic organization that have come out of the RSA, and they have a really nuanced understanding of how data and public service improvement are related. And I'd really encourage anyone thinking about public service improvement to read that chapter of the report, simply because um, Roger Taylor has got a lot of smarts there, uh, particularly when talking about personal data and what is stopping um, public data-driven public service improvement in the UK. Um, the last open data case I looked at was a favorite of mine, which is They Work For You. I think um, my first, well, I interviewed Tom Steinberg for The Guardian in 2005. They Work For You have been going for an awfully long time. And looking at them uh, provided a bit of an opportunity to look at the long-term impact of um, open data, or rather civic data, um, because actually They Work For You predates open data policy in the UK. Um, I had a lot of fun here because I applied Deloitte's monetized time savings uh, methodology to civil society members and journalists using, hand, using They Work For You, which is, an, if you don't know, is an accessible version of the parliamentary proceedings. Um, and I did a lot of multiplying and some averaging and some hypothesizing and, and worked out that uh, using a kind of bastardized version of Deloitte's methodology, They Work For You, was saving civil society and journalists. Oh, that's my timer. Sorry, video. Um, stop. 
Anyway, I gave myself five minutes less for questions, so I'll just keep going quickly. They work for you as delivered two to 70 million pounds worth of savings annually to the UK economy <laughs> based on that methodology. Um, I think it's valuable. I think it's valid. I think that civil society actors and journalists' time are just, is just as valuable as commuters' time. Um, just a quick word about why there's a non-open data study in this report. Uh, Rufus Pollock reminded me that any useful study of open data impact um, should consider the counterfactual and Celiax UK, UK's use of brand banks data on food and allergens um, is a story that's very close to my heart because I have a Celiac, UK, uh, Celiac um, uh, daughter. Um, read, read the study if you want to understand what all of this means. In short, um, it really gives a window on how rich data uh, sort of frictionless data sets can transform people with, you know, particular needs from the supply chain, um, from the food supply chain, can transform their lives. And w I wanted to include it because I wanted to make the point that it's not always about the openness, perhaps, that we're seeing impact. So, sometimes it can be about the richness of the data set, its relevance to, um, to a particular community, or, you know, its ability to be translated onto platforms like smartphones, all of which were present in this case, um, that the impact comes. Um, I think open data would be a great way for a uh, brand bank to go, but they've just been acquired by Nielsen, so we see how, we'll see how that goes. Um, that I want to kind of finish this talk with, uh, with two, two challenges to this community, uh, which has grown so much in the time that I've been involved in open data. Um, we heard, anyone who was in NFT1 this morning um, heard the minister, uh, heard Matthew Hancock not rule out privatizing the trading funds um, and selling their data as the previous government did uh, with the privatization of Royal Mail. We also are um, in a government where the Freedom of Information Act is currently under review. Um, Open Data has enjoyed a very collegiate relationship with government and policymakers, but um, it may be time for that attitude to change, or we may have to adjust to uh, new circumstances. So I'd like to ask everyone in this room um, if Open Data is important to you as a business, if Open Data is important to you as a citizen, to um, look and keep a good eye on what's happening policy-wise and to make sure the government r remains committed to Open Data over the course of this, um, over the course of this, this parliament and, and, and the next lot. Um, finally, a quote from Chris Taggart that I really love, because although this report is all about looking at the evidence and the impact of Open Data, I share his view that... Um, Open data is as much a right as it is an economic policy, and it's probably time for us to ask our opponents to argue for closed data, because open data looks like the future, and I certainly count myself as a member of uh, Generation Open. So I think I left one minute and 40 seconds for questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Becky. Um, do we have any questions? Or I could just talk for another minute and a half. I guess I, I have a question, if okay. I may. Um, so uh, you mentioned before uh, the guy from TFL who said if you had to write a business case, he would still be writing it. Um, do you think that um, open data has, uh, is so disruptive that it essentially will, will have to push some of those systems and processes out of the way for businesses to actually be able to adopt more open data practices? Or if you want this impact to actually have, um, want stories like this that actually have impact in how businesses operate? Well, I think, um, I think governments in, I don't know if you can hear me through this, I think governments in a unique position to show the way here. So just like TfL released its data, and then you saw the people behind national rail inquiries, the ATOC operators, feel empowered to do so, I think because government's able to take those kinds of risks, it should. Um, and I was having, you know, thrown a stone at the minister about the trading funds. I was really enthused to him say that, you know, you can't tell what open data is going to do. You have to, I have his exact words written down. They're not here. But it was something to the extent of you have to open the data and then you'll see what happens. And I think um, if HM Trev Treasury are listening to that, that would be really fantastic. Kind of suck it and see. Well, kind of the more stories we have like this, and the reason I think Omidia Network wanted to investigate these stories in greater depth was, you know, you may not be able to model it for your own business or your own context, um, but if you see more and more people taking the leap of faith and succeeding, um, you know, if, 
I, I, I got to know Brand Bank uh, quite intimately. I, they were very open to me off the record about their business models. And, you know, I could kind of see that they were almost close to a subheading on an ODI business case. You know, they were that close to opening it. But I do understand why people have reservations. And that's why it's great that government, as a massive data collector, is able to lead the way and to, to, to set these examples. And I just think they need to keep doing it. Thank you very much. Oh, we have a question down here. Uh, do you want to? Oh, yeah, I'll give you my mic. I don't know where the other mic's gone. Thanks. Uh, Andrew Clark, a Media Network. Um, on the um, question of uh, the Celiac UK case, uh -huh. um, it sounded, uh, from what I remember reading, was that it was about a social impact organisation being quite reliant on a closed data set for its business model, for, for keeping its re uh, revenues. Mm. Did you find any other sort of generalisable um, conclusions about? Uh, CSOs or NGOs not, not, not releasing their own data for the sort of wider good? Oh, yeah, no, I think I know what you're talking about. I'm not sure that bit made it into the final report. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I really asked, um, I, I, there were a lot of hypotheticals in the Celiac and Brandback UK case, and whereas I speculate in the published version of the report that um, Brand Bank uh, could benefit from opening up its data because it's a bit like HMLR, you know, the people, you know, it's a, it's a supply side fee. Um, you know, peop they, they, they generally they want people to have as much access to their data about food and allergens and stuff as possible. They essentially populate Amazon and Ocado and all those platforms with, with food data. I wasn't quite sure whether Celiac UK would benefit from opening up its data because it relies on, it, the, the data has to be of such a high quality to benefit Celiacs. And moreover, Celiacs uh, pay money to Celiac UK and that helps them lobby on policy and, and stuff. So I guess because I had a person, and, and in a way, I I kind of felt like I was suddenly empathizing with Ordnance Survey all of a sudden, because <laughs> actually, what would happen if Celiac UK lost its membership su subscriptions? Would it be able to campaign as effectively as it has done on food? And were those membership subscriptions being um, being uh, driven by access to this rich data about about food allergens that it was getting from from Brand Bank, and that it had got you know got itself on, through other means before um, before Brand Bank and, and this partnership, which is fairly recent, it's about two years old. Uh, so yeah, I began to feel like I was slightly having empathy with Ordnance Survey and all these other ones taking this leap of faith, essentially. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's a valid question to ask as a follow-up, actually, because I think it's pretty much the same issue. Thank you very much. Thanks once again, Becky.